Great. Thank you very much for the introduction, Ray. Again, my name is Todd Saunders, and I am the uh, EVP of Customer Solutions at Exidia. A uh, little background about me, I've been in the business intelligence arena for many years. I, I've uh, got close to 20 years of experience in both technology and BI and data warehousing. I've worked both for consulting firms and uh, have actually built data warehouses for companies. So I've uh, not only talked about how to build data warehouses, I've done them myself and uh, with my team. So I uh, know, know what that experience feels like and hopefully uh, over the years have learned a few things, what works and what doesn't. So uh, today I just want to share some of my learnings with you and I, I hope you find the uh, session today both useful and informational. And it's something that uh, maybe you can apply to your business as uh, you're moving forward. I'm sure some of you are either in the middle of a day with warehousing projects or possibly uh, considering them, and maybe there will be some insights in the uh, presentation today that can help you out. So some topics we're going to cover today. Uh, we're just going to start out with an overview of uh, you know, what a data warehouse is and talk about some of the components. Then we'll get in a little bit more to the uh, different architectures that might be available. Uh, I'm going to mention briefly the difference between a data warehouse and an operational data store. ODS is operational data store. You'll hear that term sometimes. So I just want to make sure you're comfortable knowing what the uh, differences are. Uh, I'm going to talk briefly about different development approaches. Uh, you, you definitely have options there. And then I'm going to finish up with a couple short lists that are some bullet points of things that are uh, useful pieces of information for you. And then uh, we'll try to leave a few minutes at the end of the uh, presentation for questions. So first of all, data warehousing definition. Uh, there are some formal definitions out there. In fact, I'll come uh, shortly to others. But in general, uh, the way I like to think about data warehousing is that is the process of gathering and analyzing corporate information to help make better business decisions and improve, and improve performance. There's a few different terms uh, that kind of get mixed up and sometimes people are using them in their own way and it can lead to some uh, issues with communication. One talking about one thing, different person talking about something else. I'll spend just a couple minutes here on a few key definitions. Uh, my definition here is data warehousing and data warehousing is a process. And it has to do with gathering information uh, that is going to be uh, ultimately important for decision makers in business. Getting that information into a centralized location, making sense of it, and organizing it so that the businesses can get to it, the business users can get to it more easily and make sense out of it. Uh, they'll be able to look at that data, know what it means, uh, consistent uh, definitions of the data that's in the databases and come up with consistent answers when they ask the question. But, uh, having that consistency is very important in a data warehousing environment. Now another term you'll hear and I'll be talking about today is a data warehouse. A data warehouse is a component of the entire data warehousing solution. We'll talk about where that fits in. Now other terms you're going to hear a lot for you to do now are business intelligence, for example. The way we business intelligence is that it is the overall process of gathering and using information. The data warehouse and the data warehousing solution is usually the cornerstone of a BI solution. The data warehouse is where all that information is managed and manipulated to enable the business intelligence strategy. Uh, sometimes we hear the term BI tool. A lot of times what that refers to is the actual front-end reporting and analysis tool. Those tools usually sit on top of a data warehouse. Again, I'll step through this in a little more detail later. But as you hear these terms throughout the presentation, I just want you to know how, I'm, how I use those terms and what they mean to me so that when I say them, we're on the same page. So, the driver here behind uh, data warehouse, and I just want to point that out at the bottom, is ultimately uh, it's a project like any other, and within a business, a data warehousing solution needs to provide value in some way. 
And the value usually falls into one of three categories. It can be increased revenue, improved customer relationships, or decreased costs. Those are the things that typically businesses are going after, and that's where you get your ROI on any kind of project. And that's really what a data warehouse needs to achieve. Now here's a view of data and typically how people get to it. Uh, the chart in the background there is you know, one example of a, a large client's information system. They've got all kinds of software and computer systems throughout the organization. This is kind of a stylized map together. And then you've got the users at the bottom. And different users need to go to different places to get the information they need to do their job. That information can be all over the place. And it may or may not be integrated and shared and consistent. So it's very difficult often for these different groups to, number one, get the information they need, and number two, make sure it's right and consistent. So it's a difficult environment to work in. It takes a lot of manual effort. It can be confusing. And that's some of the impetus behind a data warehouse. We want to simplify the data that is needed to run the business. You probably still need all the operational systems in there. Operational systems perform very specific day-to-day -day operations. They help run your business, and they're needed. But as you're trying to do analysis on the business, as you're trying to learn more about the business by analyzing the data, there should be a better way to get the data that you need and make sure that data is clear and consistent and concise and uh, in the format that you need. So here's a typical situation that kind of illustrates what I just said. Say there's uh, some kind of program that you need a report for. We're just calling it XYZ programs, and we want to report on the XYZ program. Well, someone may need to go out and gather data from a whole lot of different places. So there's lots of uh, operational systems out there. Maybe they've been doing this for a while, so they've kind of got figured out where they need to go. As you know, in large organizations, there's constantly upgrades, uh, things are changing, and not everyone necessarily gets notified about it. But anyway, let's say we've got someone that roughly knows where to go to get the data they need. Well, they can bring that data down, and maybe they do manipulation on their own uh, personal PC at their desk, uh, load it into an access database. They do something with it, but they get the data, and they do some manipulation. And they provide maybe a somewhat cleaned up data set that then a report can be built off of. So here we've got you know, some kind of report that's going against that data set that someone or a team of people uh, had, to, had to work on to get that data together. And as an example, we had one report from a, a real client. Uh, they had three to four analysts working on this quarterly report. And every quarter, it took three to four people two to three weeks actually develop that report. So when you add that up, that's close to 60 man days of effort every quarter just to develop this one report. But even, and, and some of the reasons why that took so long were this, even though these people knew where to go for the information, there were still questions. And this, I think, is more the rule than the exception. When you have people that have to go to different operational systems every month, every quarter, whatever the frequency is, they're going to have questions about it. They want to know, you know, do my data sources still match up and how do they match up? Is the data recent or has it changed? Has it not been updated for a while? Was there some delay going on that they didn't know about it? Sometimes, and you know, you know about this in large organizations, you have to get into a system to get the data out. Now, especially if you're in a healthcare company. Uh, do you have permission to see uh, the, the patient data? And have you gone through the HIPAA training so that uh, you, you are cleared by the, your company's security policy? Or are you restricted from it? Does it be masked before you can see it? So sometimes to get the data can be a major effort in and of itself. And then once you think you pulled down all the right data, you know, maybe you did, maybe you didn't. And you're asking yourself, well, did I get everything I need? And maybe I identified the data source, but did I get all the data off the data source? Were there potentially other files on the data source that I wasn't aware of? Um, so those are questions you want to ask. And now, 
there may be new sources of data or there may be a new question. And so you ask, where do I find the data? Now I've got to go back and scour all these different operational systems to figure out if the data is there. And what I pulled, maybe I do a quick reality check myself and say, well, I went to this one source system and I pulled down 10,000 records. I would have expected 200,000 records. Why am I only getting 10,000? Maybe data is missing, maybe it's not. Once you pull data down, maybe you look at a few records to validate it, and you realize you don't understand what is in some of these columns. Some of this data just doesn't make sense to you. It's not clear. Uh, you're seeing values you haven't seen before. So you've got a lot of questions about it. And then, why are you seeing different values in two different sources? You may be in a unique position that you're pulling data in the same way from two different operational systems, and it turns out that those two operational systems never have a need to really talk to each other, except for the thing that you're doing. So you're the one that gets to compare these two source systems side by side, and you're seeing variances. You don't know why that is. And then, even after you go through all that process, and you get the data, and now you're trying to clean it up, now you have questions. How exactly do you define that data? Maybe you're seeing these variances in two different systems, and you really don't know which one should be the master record, which one's better, which one's more recent, uh, and is that the goal record. So there's lots of questions about how to combine it. Maybe you're seeing invalid data. What do you do with that? Are you in a position where you can make the decision on how to clean the data, or do you need to go back to the source of record and talk to the, uh, the schemes on that operational system and ask them to clean it, or ask them, how to clean it or what the issues are. If you're trying to combine data, do you know how you can aggregate it? Can things be added together? Uh, maybe some of the data you have is already aggregated, so if you're trying to do averages on something, you may, may not be able to get accurate averages. And a lot of times, there's data in operational systems uh, that, that you shouldn't include. That data is an old record, and there was a newer record that is really the most valid one. Do you know what all those rules are for each and every operational system? Sometimes you need to look at a max update date, for example, uh, and you know that that's the most current record. You know, sometimes part of a record has current information, part of it has old information. How do you handle that? So there's lots of questions with each of the source systems as you bring down that data. And then you know, figuring out who knows the answer. And it's true that in a lot of cases, operational systems that have been running for years, and the people who originally wrote it are no longer with the company. The documentation is lacking, if it exists at all. And there may or may not be experts who can tell you exactly how that data is created, what the business rules are, what it means, and how it should be used relative to other data. I actually had a, uh, a client years ago where we had a primary source of data that we were going to use for our data warehousing solution. And we asked the usual question going in, well, you'll give us your opinion of the data quality. And the guy looked at me and said, this data is perfect. We build off this data. We're very concerned about data quality. So you've got no worries there. You're not going to have to spend a lot of time trying to clean up the data. We ended up a few weeks later having a meeting where the people who had been managing that particular source system were in the room for the first time you know, in who knows how long with other people who had uh, who were in charge of the system that fed data to that other system where we were getting most of our data. During that meeting, we asked a question about, well, how is this particular field created? The owners of the system said, well, this is how that data is created. The people on the other side of the table who were feeding data said, no, no, no not how it's created. It's something totally different. It means something totally different. And it was a shock to everyone in the room. They had been treating it this way for you know, upwards of five years. And for the first time, these two groups actually got together to talk about the data. <clears throat> and they discovered there was a major discrepancy there. That is uh, something that you run across a lot in data warehousing solutions. Because you're trying to pull data, and we'll get through this in a little bit, but I just want to make the point that you're going to be pulling data from a lot of different sources, and when you start getting down and looking at that data field by field and trying to figure out how it relates to other data, you start to turn over a lot of stones that haven't been turned over in a long time. And you could end up 
learning things that even the means for that particular system hadn't run across before. So there could be a lot of questions, a lot of extra effort that uh, that goes into figuring out the data quality and uh, how to adjust for data quality in building a data warehouse solution. Now the nice thing is we've got all these questions here about all these different source systems and a lot of times each of these questions I talked about are asked pretty much every single time a report is run. Well, oh, I have one more question there even. A couple more. And the thing is with data warehousing, that's the part that gets automated. You come up with consistent business rules and you code those business rules into the data warehousing solution so you don't have to ask those questions every time you try to run the report. These questions will get asked up front, part of the requirements gathering process. You code the answers into the solution and then it's run the same way every time moving forward. So because of all those questions, you know, this is a very typical scenario here. Uh, the current environment, your data analysts, the people who want to get data, run reports, and then analyze the reports, they spend 80% of their time being what we kind of jokingly call data gophers, running around, trying to find the data, bringing it back to their nest, working with it, getting it cleaned, merged, consolidated, integrated, uh, trying to understand it. They can finally build a report, and then they've only got 20% of their time left to actually think about it and analyze it and do something with it. These are people who are probably hired because of their expertise in marketing or supply chain uh, or inventory management. And rather than doing those activities, they're actually splitting with spreadsheets or talking with SMEs on operational systems about what data means and how to get it. And they're not really doing the job that they're hired to do. Now, in an ideal environment, they would be spending about 20% of their time understanding the source data and 80% of their time analyzing results. So that's what we want to get to. And that's, again, the impetus behind the data warehousing solution. The data warehousing solution reduces the amount of time that individuals have to spend manipulating data, and we automate that. And that's why we can cut the time down. Again, this is your 80-20 rule. Results will vary depending on you know, your particular circumstances. But in general, we've seen plenty of cases where this is approximately uh, the results that we get. So in general, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to take these typical operational systems and suck the data out of them that we need in an organized and automated fashion to put them into a BI solution where the data can be consolidated, organized, and integrated. People who want to analyze data have one place to go. They can sit at their desk with their front end presentation layer tool and they can get to that organized layer of data where there's a data dictionary that describes what the data is, how to use it, where it comes from, and they can do their jobs much faster because they're not spending a lot of time being data builders. And analyzing the data is probably what they want to do anyway, rather than just trying to gather data and decipher it. So we should be increasing their job satisfaction as well through these. Now, on this slide, I want to talk about the very high level uh, components on the major components of a data warehousing solution, the end-to-end -end solution. First of all, we're, we're going left to right here. We're going to talk about getting data into the solution. And then the middle part of the architecture is where we manage the data. And the right side, the front end of the solution, is where we get information out. It's where the business users access the information. So the first thing we want to look at are the data sources. Where exactly does the data reside that we need? Now, we figure that out by first going through a requirements gathering process, talking to the business users. Number one, first and foremost, figuring out what business problem we're trying to solve and where does the data exist in the company to be able to answer the question to solve that business problem. So once we figure out where that data is, we can go look at that data. We can go look at the data sources and figure out what data we need. Now, the idea is we want to pull the data 
you know, get copies of the data out of the data sources and move it into our data warehouse. And the way we do that is through a process called EPL, which is Extract, Translate, and Load. We're extracting data from the source system. We're translating or transforming it uh, into a format that is going to work in the data warehouse. It's going to help us integrate the information. We're going to conform data. We'll talk about that in a minute. But the EPL is the movement of data, really, simply put, from point A to point B. Point A, in this case, is the source system. Point B is going to be our data warehouse solution. So we want to move the data from point A to point B, and then once it's in point B, we can manipulate it and organize it the way we want it to go. One note about this, when we're doing data warehousing solutions, EPL is typically 75 to 80 percent of the effort. So when you think about the time needed to build out a data warehouse and the skill sets and the people you need, most of the time and effort and skill is going to go into the EPL process. The reason is that's where the actual head down coding takes place for the most part. Usually your business rules are coded into the EPL tool or process. Maybe you're hand coding the EPL. But that's where the business rules are going to be written in. And that is how each and every field uh, coming from the source system to going into the data warehouse is going to be touched. The ETL controls that. Now, there may be an ancillary part of ETL uh, where we're managing the, the data and trying to conform it. One example here is CDI, customer data integration. A lot of times, a lot of companies will have their master customer list, and they want to make sure that they keep that consistent. So what they will do is they will uh, receive new records that have a customer name in it, and maybe that name has a slightly different spelling. You know, I can use my name, for example. Maybe in in my latest record, I just bought something, and for whatever reason, the online form is T. Saunders. And that's what it looks like in the record that goes into the sales system at the company. However, I bought from there before, and when I bought before, I spelled out my full name. It was Todd Saunders. And I don't want two records, or the company really doesn't want two records in there. They don't want a record for T. Saunders and a separate record for Todd Saunders because it makes it look like they've got two customers where they really only have one. CBI and the business logic that goes with it is a way to help ensure that you're matching up records like that. You can do that for product names. Um, you can do that for your client list. So there's different types of data that you want to make sure you have a master list for. In the ETL process, in the data warehousing solution, to leverage that. Now, the center part here is the data warehouse. The data warehouse is the place where the data comes together. And you, as the data warehouse development team, are going to define this. You are going to make the decisions about how that data comes together based on the information the business gives you about what the data means. But you're going to define that structure, and you're going to define how to conform the data, how to integrate the data, and how to make sense out of it. There's another step then, and I'll get into a little more detail on these, but what we want to do now is take that whole set of data from the data warehouse and pull out subject-oriented pieces of it and organize it in such a way that it's really easy for the business to look at that data and understand it. And typically, a lot of your front end BI tools, um, you know, some that you may have heard of before, I'm not advocating any of these. We work with all of them. Uh, they all have strengths and weaknesses, but, you know, most of them are free to uh, One's like business objects, Tiger, and the open source tools from Aho. They like to sit on a certain kind of data structure called the star schema. Your data marks are typically a star schema structure because that works very well with the front end reporting and analytics. Now, you may have a uh, group of people that are true statisticians with PhDs that, that majored in SAS, uh, that use tools like SAS or the open source R, and they really want to look at raw data. So you may have an analytics mark that is not a star schema, and it's really raw data. It's just raw text files, and they want as much of it as they can, and they turn their tools loose on it to do the uh, data modeling and analytics that they want to do. So that's another structure you can have for data marks. Now, the final layer here is the presentation layer. Excuse me. The presentation layer 
is the layer through which the business users access the data. For several reasons, it's usually the case that you do not want the business users going directly against the data warehouse. The reason being, you need to be pretty sophisticated uh, from the data architecture and data point of view to understand how to get the data out of the data warehouse. And you need to know that particular data warehouse structure. The data marts are organized so that it's a lot easier for the business users to get to the data and understand it and pull it out with the tool. That, uh, you know, that's the reason we have the data marts in there. A lot of times the finance person, they only want finance information, information that is has been put together and organized specifically for them. You don't want to have to dig through a lot of other tables and fields that are not relevant to them. They want to get just the data they need. And so it's possible to build a data mark specifically for one particular group within your business and provide them only the data that they really want. And that makes it easier for them to learn it, use it, know it, and feel comfortable with it. So this is a very high level architecture, truly really a 10,000 foot view, and there's a lot of detail that goes into each of these different layers. But the general flow is roughly the same. We're taking data from source systems, we're organizing it within the data warehouse and integrating it, we're further organizing it based on subject areas for the business users, and then we're putting a front end tool on top of the whole thing to make it easy or as easy as possible for the business users to get to the information they need. Now, there's a couple different ways we can organize. What I showed on the previous screen is close, more, most closely related to this architecture here, which originally came from Bill Inman, which is called the hub and spoke model. The hub being the data warehouse, where all the data sources feed into the data warehouse, and then you build your various data marts directly off the data mart. And then I mentioned early on, there's a very specific definition that um, Bill Inman came up with for a data warehouse. And this is the one that you know, we still hear a lot. And notice this is back from 1992. That a data warehouse is a subject-oriented, integrated, non-volatile, time-variant collection of data organized to support management needs. So maybe I'll talk about each of these terms very briefly. Subject-oriented means that we're, for example, trying to get within the data warehouse all the finance data into a set of tables that make sense relative to that financial data. Maybe you've got marketing data. Maybe you've got sales data. Maybe you've got human resource data. We want to try to organize the data so that it makes sense. You know where it is in the warehouse, and you can get to it as needed for the data marks. Integrated is another key term. You may have finance data in just about every data source that you have. You need to figure out how to bring it together. The data warehouse is where you want that integrated data to reside. There's lots of business rules that go into that. And between <coughs> the ETL rules and the rules within the uh, database itself, you can define how that data will be integrated. Non-volatile, that is uh, an interesting term. What it means is that the data is not going to change. A data warehouse maintains usually historical data that doesn't change, meaning you don't go back and change history. You can continue to update the data warehouse with the most current data, but the way a data warehouse is defined, picture this scenario, it's the end of January, and you want to know what your sales to date for the month of January was, and maybe you run this on February 1st. You get an answer for sales to date, you know, uh, for the month of January, and you ran that report on February 1st. If you come back on March 1st and say, well, I, I lost my report when I ran it before, I want to run it again. I want to find out what the sales for the month of, the year-to-date sales for January was, but I'm running it on March 1st now. You should get exactly the same answer if you're pulling it from the data warehouse. There should not have been a way where someone could go in and manipulate the data that was written in the January. There may be cases where in February there were updates that would happen in January. That would not show up until you ran the reports later in February after the update was made. So every report you ran at a certain date, if you have exactly the same parameters, you'll be able to run the report at any time in the future. 
nature and get the same result. That's what non-volatile means. So data is captured in the warehouse and to a certain extent, the fixture is being carved in stone. The only way it gets changed is if you add and update records to it. And then you have to have business rules about how you interpret that update record and what you do with the original record. Time variant means that things are changing over time and that you're adding data. And if you are looking at year-to-date sales and you want to know what your revenue is year-to-date, year-to-date is going to change every day and every time you add new records. That's what time variant means. So those are some of the specific quantities that Mr. Inman came up with uh, to help define a data warehouse. The structure of the warehouse is a, uh, another topic. We're not going to get in, into that. The data model issue. Usually, those of you who are familiar with it, uh, data warehouse has more of a normalized uh, form. It reduces redundancy, and it's faster to load. The data mart, which is our schemas, do have redundant data, making them slower to load, but faster to query. So they're in different parts of the architecture, and they have different structures for different reasons. Data warehouses, we want to be able to get data loaded into them quickly. Data marks to uh, be able to support very fast query results. Now, there's another structure here that we're going to look at, and this is the Kimball structure. Uh, both Kimball and Inman uh, were published in books in the early, mid-90s, and uh, there's some books you may have heard of. Data Warehouse Lifecycle Toolkit was published by uh, Kim, uh, a few others, and it was you know, also considered the Data Warehouse Revival for a long time. And his structure was a little bit different. He was advocating that a data warehouse is actually the sum of data marks within a company. Anytime you needed to answer a question, uh, this structure says you answer the question by finding out what, what they a schema or something close to that, a denormalized structure with the data to the question. As you do that, you're going to accumulate you know, several data marks, and the sum of those data marks is really the data warehouse uh, within, within your company. You need to have some form of logic, some centralized place that the data goes to, though, to make sure it's conformed, and that's how you help to ensure consistency among the different data marks. But maybe I should talk about that term conform for just a minute here. What we're looking at is you know, a very simple example. Uh, say we've got one data source that is capturing uh, information about um, potential employees, and one of it, one of the fields in there is for them to identify their gender, either male or female. Uh, we've got another system, the actual HR system, uh, not for potential hires, but for existing employees, and that's got a gender field in it, male or female. Well, in one source, the way the information is stored potentially is the letter M or the letter F for male or female. Uh, in a different system, it's the full word that's in there. It's the word male or the word female. Maybe there's a third system that has gender in it, and that's simply a one and a zero. And what we want the conform layer to do is say, you know what, we've got all these different code sets that mean the same thing, but we relate to them or refer to them differently. We just want to have one standard for all of our data marks. Let's say for all of our data marks, we only want gender to be M or F. And so if we have a data source that's providing male and female, form layer will read that and change the male to the letter M and change female to the letter F before it writes it into the data box. So that's one example. Um, and even that can get very tricky. I was uh, you know, working with a client who's actually a uh, Department of Corrections client. And we were talking about uh, actually the gender field and how that would need to be performed. And it turned out they actually had seven different codes for uh, gender. So I'll let you ponder that one a little bit. Uh, but there were a lot of different options for them. Uh, you know, another example uh, that you can look at is date fields. We had a client recently where we were uh, needing to conform dates, and we came up with, from their source system, 20, I believe it was 22 different date formats. Pretty much any variation you can think of, you know, day, day, month, month, year, year. Uh, 
you know, month, month, day, day, year, year, month, month, day, day, year, 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 uh, month, month, dash, day, day, dash, year, year, and all the different variations all along with Julian dates and some other custom formats. So we actually had 22 different algorithms built into our conform process to translate those dates into one base field in our data warehousing solution. So the conform layer, there can be a lot of effort there, and you've got to find all the different uh, variations and figure out how to form that data. So again, there's your Kimball warehouse. It's just the summary of all the marts. Now, the data warehouse itself, and, you know, I, I had the picture drawn back a few slides where you saw the data warehouse and data marts. Really, in, in this architecture here, uh, which we're we work with uh, a guy named Bob Conway, Dr. Bob Conway. He has developed this architecture and he teaches his course at the Brick Institute, uh, or Brick, I think it's Breckenridge Academy now. Um, the, uh, he teaches a course about this stuff and how it is to build out this kind of data warehousing solution. You'll see it's pretty similar uh, to what I talked about before when I talked about the, uh, the physical high level architecture. We start here with source systems. And then from source systems, we move into uh, what's called the first layer of the warehouse, which is the acquisition layer. Uh, the acquisition layer is simply a landing zone. We want to get data out of the source uh, unobtrusively as possible. We want to be minimally interrupted. Just get the data out quickly and pop it down somewhere where we can then manipulate it when we're getting ready. So the acquisition layer typically looks almost exactly like the source layer, and it's just a place to land the data. Then from the source layer, what we want to do is get these sources ultimately into our base layer, uh, which is, back to my, uh, my previous picture, the data warehouse. We do that by moving the data through a conform layer. The conform layer takes care of uh, gender, and date, and other issues, things like that. And so we can move data from acquisition in the conform, and then through this ETL process, it's a small box, but it's a complex one, we get the data into uh, the single database where it's persistent, integrated, detailed, normalized, and in this case, not just storage data. This is our, uh, in this architecture, the data warehouse has just the current data. Now, what we can do is the dimensional or data mark uh, databases. And these are, we call them DIM, you know, it's the data mark, it's the dimensional, historic, summarized, derived data, derived from the data warehouse. History can be kept over in the history database. Now this is a framework, it's a very good framework, and this is the one that is our going into position when we go into a, uh, a place that has no warehouse at all. We say this is the architecture with, and we may tailor it a little bit, but this is uh, where we start when we want to build out a new data warehousing solution. So the interesting thing about this, and we want to point is when I talked about getting data out of the source systems and into the acquisition layer, the reason we want to do that is this is the area that we can control, everything inside the circle here. This is going to be, for the data warehouse team, their sandbox. They're in charge of that equipment. They can play with it. They can build their data models. They can change their They can uh, work on the ETL tools, and they can get to the data. Now, especially as you're doing development, there's a lot of times you want to go back and get the source data. Well, they've got a copy of it here in the acquisition layer. And that way, if something changes or you know, during development, something goes wrong, you need the data again, you don't have to go back and talk to the people that are managing the source system. First of all, you may have, you know, a hundred different source systems here. Second of all, people managing the source system may be extremely busy. They've got their own issues. Maybe they're in the middle of an upgrade. You know, something's going on. It's difficult for them. There's security issues. They don't want you to keep coming back to the data again and again and again. They may not. Maybe their systems are running you know, near 100% uh, utilization, and to do a large data extract for you means shutting down uh, the, the system for a while uh, to, you know, to production use. So you want to be able to get that data out as quickly, as easily as possible, move it into your sandbox, and then you can do with it what you want as a data warehouse. But this architecture works very well for us. 
and uh, we, we follow this model quite a uh, just got her. So that was the data warehousing discussion. Uh, I'm going to briefly hear about the between and the data warehouse. Um, typically, as we say here, uh, they're both normalized structures, but data warehouse, with the data warehouse environment, is going to retain history where ODS is usually only keep the most current data. It's uh, a type of structure where people have a question usually about a particular item. Uh, maybe you want to find out if a customer ordered something six months ago. Well, that's a, a one record, yes, no kind of question that comes back. You don't use an ODS to do long-term analysis or, or historical analysis. Uh, you just use ODS to typically to answer questions uh, where you need a very short usually one or two record answer. So we'll talk about that here, do a little compare and contrast. The ODS, typically it's day-to-day -day decision making, uh, as opposed to data warehouses where it's more strategic and executive decision making. In other words, ODS, they want to know what's happening right now and need an answer. You know, how many people do I have on my production line? Versus uh, data warehousing where you may be asking, well, in general, what was the average number of people I've had working on the day shift for the last, last six months? Uh, data Warehouse would answer that question as opposed to an ODS. So transactions similar to those of an online transaction processing system. So your order entry system, uh, you're going to see an uh, order entered into it. The ODS may have that exact order entered. On the data warehouse, you may have some kind of summarized view of that. Maybe it's just total orders for the day. Something contains current or near current data, and data warehouse could have current data, but it's also going to have historical data. Uh, typically, the ODS is only going to have the detailed data, whereas a lot of the data in a warehouse can be summarized. Um, because of the structure, the only use current data can have uh, something near real time uh, as far as data frequency goes, whereas a data warehouse time most of the time is batched. There's exceptions, but usually it's actually generally modeled. The ODS is generally modeled to support rapid data updates. Uh, if you're supporting the call center, every time someone places an order, you immediately want to be in the ODS, uh, whereas the data warehouse. Uh, you're not going to be entering data that quickly because you're usually doing more historical analysis, trending type things. A lot of times, you know, one day delay in data is just fine for a data warehouse. ODSs, your update field level, uh, where ending data, not updating the record. That goes back to that non-volatile uh, component of Bill Inman's definition of a data warehouse. With an ODS, you just want the most current record of something. With a data warehouse, you want the history. So you're appending new information, but you've got the old record in there too, appropriately flagged. For an operational data store, you're using detailed decision making and operational reporting. For a warehouse, it's more of a long term decision making. So operational reporting is usually around what do I need to do right now? Uh, for uh, data warehousing, usually you're looking at you know, what's our strategy moving forward. And then used by knowledge workers, you know, those are the people that are on the line doing stuff right now. And data warehouses, typically since they're used for more strategic purposes, are going to be used at the executive level or business unit level. Very quickly, a couple different approaches you have, and maybe you've seen these before. You know, waterfall, where you follow the typical gather requirements, design the solution, build it, deploy it and then iterate. And with data warehousing, we typically like to do that in 90 to 120 day release cycles. That way value is being created every quarter or so. Um, you don't want to have a data warehouse solution where you're not going to deliver anything the business can use for three years. Uh, that's the boiling the ocean approach. You want to be able to deliver something the business can use quickly because getting the business excited about it interested and continuing to use it is very important. Uh, so you, know, you can't wait that long usually uh, to produce something. Now there's a new approach, the agile approach, which is over here on the right. And this is a much shorter cycle delivering smaller pieces of functionality 
much more quickly. Typically, an agile approach, you want to get something done every three to four weeks. It usually means that you're very focused on a very small deliverable every three to four weeks, but the idea is you're still building towards the grand picture of your data warehousing solution. It's a different management approach, and some organizations are agile, some are traditional waterfall, and it really depends on what works within your organization. So, uh, getting towards the end here, we've uh, got some bullet points here. Uh, there's going to be constraints that you face as you're trying to build out your data warehousing solution. So here's some things that can help mitigate that. You know, one, find a strong sponsor. That's one of the most key components of success, is having a strong sponsor that understands that this is going to be a large, expensive, ongoing project for quite a while. And there's really no end to it. You can decide when to stop, but a data warehouse is typically something you can continue to build on as long as you want. You want to build incrementally, deliver value early and often. As I said before, you need to keep the business engaged and happy. Get them stuff as frequently as possible. You want to solve a business problem. And it's nice if the first one you solve is relatively easy, but it's dangerous to build a data warehouse just for the sake of having one because everyone else does. It needs to have a business purpose, it should have an ROI, and it most definitely should solve some kind of business problem. There needs to be some internal marketing going on. A lot of times there's going to be change within your organization. Uh, people are going to be getting information in a different way than they usually do. And there needs to be some support for helping them understand what that change is and getting them enthused about the change. Getting them enthused and fired at advertising and talking about the benefits and kind of a marketing effort internally. You want to set expectations with the business users and keep them apprised of progress. That's where roadmaps come into play a lot. A lot of times there's going to be different business units that you're going to support. And if you can at least show them on the roadmap where their turn is coming, that goes a long way to appeasing them. Usually everyone wants everything right away, and you can't deliver it that way. So you tell HR, hey, you're getting your release on this date. Finance, you're getting your release on this date. Inventory management, here's your date. And they're, they're satisfied that they're just on the calendar and they know it's coming. Use the right tools appropriately. Uh, that's a much bigger discussion. But sometimes buy a single tool, hope that it will solve the whole BI problem, try to get it to do stuff it needs to do. That can be dangerous. Build a good BI team. This is another, uh, another longer discussion. BI is a very unique skill. It, it needs to comprise people that understand both business processes and technology. And getting people that are able to do both, it, it's a tough skill set to find, uh, really, which is why a lot of us BI consulting firms are, are in business. You know, we specifically type of people and make them available. Uh, within organizations, a lot of times you'll have people that are good at one or the other, but it's very difficult to find people that have both. With the source data team, they're the ones that know the data best. Plan to manage data quality. Going back to my uh, little story earlier on about the client that thought their data was perfect. It, there's, it's almost safe to say that there's no one that has perfect data. You're going to have data quality issues that need to manage them. Then communicate and communicate, and communicate, and communicate more. Uh, Got to keep people in the loop. Again, it's a long project. It's ongoing. It can be expensive. You need to let people know where you're standing. So some common mistakes that are made, the lack of executive sponsorship. Again, uh, you need to have that executive sponsor that can run interference for you and be your champion. Assuming the data, number one, exists and that it's fine. You may talk to the source system. The source system, SME, will tell you, oh, yeah, we got a field here that captures that data, so you're good to go. You do an extract, you go to data models, you start to load up data, and you find out, yeah, the column exists, but there's no data in it. Presentation layer complexity, not aligned with the end user skill set. You're going to find a wide range of end users. Some want a report delivered to them in hard copy. Now, maybe it's a PDF that got printed out and set on their desk. Other people are at the other end of the spectrum. They want to start with their own tool. They want to know the tool. Uh, they want to know everything with button in it. 
They want to know the data model, and they want to build their own reports and do their own analysis, and you can have everything in between. So make sure that the tool sets that are on the front end align with your particular user community. Slow response times. Uh, that has to do with a lot of different things. It could be your equipment. It could be your data structure. It could be the skill sets of the people writing queries against the data. It could be uh, the load times for the source systems that are coming in. A lot of issues there. Try to avoid it. Try to build the correct structure to avoid slow response times. Having incorrect tools, again, trying to make the tool do something it wasn't designed to do can be risky. Going it alone, not getting the right kind of expertise, it's tough to take people that are just head down programmers and tell them, hey, now you're a BI engineer and build a BI solution. There needs to be some education there, some experience, some training. Uh, so don't think that uh, someone, just because they're a great technologist, can automatically be a great BI resource. Some can, some can. Under effort, underestimate the effort to operate and maintain. You've got source systems changing all the time, and a lot of the times they're not going to tell you to change, so those nightly updates that you expect to run automatically just may not run, and it takes a lot of time and effort to stay on top of that. In flexible design, if you stick very rigidly into any kind of architecture, you may preclude yourself from answering the business problem that needs to be answered. So there needs to be some flexibility uh, built in there. Modeling the warehouse reflects the source data rather than the business. The source data is built the way it is to, uh, to support a particular operation. The data warehouse needs to be designed to support what the business needs. So make sure that that's how the warehouse is designed. And then finally, the big one, not solving a business problem. If you build this warehouse and you cannot point to a business problem that was solved, it may not, uh, may not be a good situation for you. So be sure there's a business problem identified and solve that problem. So architecture selection, how do you know what's right for you? Uh, the types of business users, so you need to understand what their needs and skill sets are. You need to provide good data and design, provide the data that the business needs. There needs to be data governance. Uh, data, again, the source systems are going to change, and you need to understand what those changes are and how that impacts how data is used in the organization. Separate data integration, reporting, and analysis. Again, that goes back to using tools the right way. Use the right tool in the right situation. Integrate data warehouse and provide data to the business through the MARGs or queues. And the reason is that data is much more organized and focused on the end user and what they need. It's dangerous to turn all the end users loose on the whole data warehouse where they can be coming through everything. The biggest danger being they may not know exactly what all that data is or how to use it. The data needs to be presented in a friendly way to the business user, so there should be driving what that front end looks like. And the data dictionary is how they're going to understand the data. So good data dictionary is important. Uh, we're running short on time here, but very quickly, uh, one item, uh, one of the industry trends that's come up, you're hearing a lot about is big data. I found this graphic that shows how it's uh, used, and I wanted to point that out. A big data solution that's not necessarily place a data warehouse, it's going to be a preprocessor usually for a data warehouse. You may have all kinds of data, a lot of it, web data, quick screen data coming in, unstructured data. A solution like Hadoop uh, can store that data, make sense out of it, and then once that data has been made sense of and organized, the organized or aggregated data can be sent to the data warehouse for further analysis. Um, otherwise, there are tools available to go through uh, data stored in a Hadoop uh, structure, uh, file structure, uh, but it's going to likely be separate from your warehouse. So, Anyway, just wanted to bring that up. I know data, big data is a hot topic right now, and you may have questions about that. So that's the presentation. Um, Todd, I'll turn it over to Ray and see if there are any questions. Yeah, Todd, great, great job um, consolidating a huge topic into a great introduction. And we do, just in the last few minutes, I've had a couple um, great questions come in. One, I think that'll be a relatively quick answer. Uh, what is the difference between EDW and DW? Uh, EDW, that's uh, 
acronym is Enterprise Data Warehouse, where EW is Data Warehouse. The difference really is in the scope of the data that uh, comes into play in your solution. Some companies, uh, when they consider they want to consolidate data from pretty much every corner of their business, they'll call it an enterprise data warehouse. A lot of times, there's just a particular business unit that wants their data managed, and they'll call it just a data warehouse because it's not serving the whole enterprise, it's just serving their business. Great. Um, we've got we've got two more here. I, I don't know that we'll have time to answer both of them, but let me throw one of these out to you. How are changes to business logic and source schema best handled once you've got all your ETL processes designed and implemented? You want to have release processes in place. Uh, you need to have a good relationship with the source data, and if there is changes to the source data, hopefully the operational system can give you some lead time so that you can make adjustments to your ETL code, you can test with the new source data, and then you can schedule a uh, specific time to release the new code into the warehouse. And the reason you want to do a release is that you're right, it's going to change your ETL logic, it may even change your data models within the data warehouse, it may change a data mark structure, and it may change front end reporting. So all of that needs to be coordinated. So the, the key here is stay in close contact with the source systems and get as much lead time on changes as you can. Great. And let's see if we can get one more in here. Um, how would metadata be managed under Dr. Conway's architecture? Uh, metadata would be managed in the conform layer. So I don't know if we called it out specifically, but usually we do have a metadata database that can contain the rules that are mostly used in the conform layer and in that ETL3 uh, box. So the ETL3 uh, can go to the metadata layer and ask questions about how to transform certain fields. Okay. And Todd, that actually that actually addresses the, the questions that actually a couple came in here. Um, any any one more here, any third party tools for metadata generation? We will. We, we don't advocate anyone in particular. So a lot of times, if you've got one in house, we're happy to work with it. Okay, great. So Todd, um, I'm going to let you take uh, take us to the next slide and, and give some contact information. Uh, again, thank you for your investment taking a, a big topic and co consolidated it into an hour. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for being here today, and uh, we'll point out that we did record the webinar. And we will uh, send you an email on how to um, access the recording uh, once we process it and have it up on our website. And Todd, why don't you go ahead and wrap it up here with the contact information, and and uh, and we will be we'll be all set. All right, I should be on this. Oops, it was on the screen, so I hope everyone can see that. All right, thank you, everybody.